the section of James, again, we move into now is, is again, very loosely organized at best. And I, I, I want to, again, indicate how cautiously I'm trying to suggest uh, the way the topics might interrelate and, and so forth, because it is very uh, hard to see always what the train of thought is, and I don't want to impose a train of thought on James. But uh, let me just make one point first. We were just talking about, of course, 4, 11 to 12, and as I pointed out there, one of the issues that, that James seems to be talking about is an arrogant attitude there, isn't it? Um, uh, you know, those presuming to judge the brother or the sister, uh, putting themselves in a sense in place of God, who is the only one who is qualified and given the right to enter into that kind of judgment. Um, and so it's not perhaps by accident that this very next paragraph, the end of chapter four, uh, is really talking about arrogance. Uh, as kind of a fundamental problem that James isolates here. So, so we, we could see at that point uh, uh, a, a sort of continuity that might say, well, maybe we shouldn't draw too heavy a line between 11 to 12 and 13 and following. In both of these paragraphs, 4, 13 to 17, and then 5, 1 to 6, you know, James uses a literary device, begins each the same way. Our versions will translate in different ways. TNIV is now listen, I think, uh, and some translate more uh, literally, come now, uh, but it's, it's an attention-getting device. So obviously James is signaling that these paragraphs are probably related in a certain way, and I think we probably need to respect that, and I'm suggesting that in 413 to 17, there's the denunciation of the arrogance associated with wealth, as we'll see, it's probably implicit that these people in 413 and following are relatively wealthy. Uh, and then, of course, very explicitly in 5.1 to 6, a denunciation of the abuse of wealth. Uh, the question then remains what to do with 5, 7 through 11 and why attach that here? I'll explain that as we go. Let, let's wait until we get to that paragraph. But I think there is good reason to uh, attach 5, 7 to 11 to uh, 5, 1 to 6 in particular, uh, because of some themes that I think are uh, common to both James and the Old Testament here. So my, my, my suggestion again is that in, in a broad way, in, in this part of the letter, uh, again, James is, is calling us to move toward being holistic, unified, consistent Christians uh, by living out of a Christian worldview. Deliberately very broad and vague topic I have chosen because it has to be broad and vague to cover everything James says here. But, but I do think there, there's kind of the issue here of, of a fundamental worldview perspective. Who are we? Uh, what is the nature of our wealth? Uh, th these are sort of fundamental issues that James is touching on here, it seems to me, in this section of the letter. Now, 413 to uh, 17 uh, especially uh, raises a couple of questions for us that we, we need to answer initially. Uh, first of all, James doesn't identify who the people are that he's addressing. Uh, unlike other parts of the letter where he specifically addresses brothers and sisters, those who are in Christ, um, here he just talks about you who say, and the parallel with 5.1, now listen, you rich people, where again you have that second plural address, where James is sort of uh, addressing uh, people in that way, might suggest that, that as in 5.1 to 6, the people do not seem to be believers, so here in 4.13 to 17, perhaps the people aren't believers either. That, that similar introduction, that similar opening, and, and the kind of distance created, you know, and you who say might suggest this. And so some interpreters think uh, that we have here in 413 to 17 a denunciation of the, um, uh, of unbelievers who uh, display this worldly and arrogant attitude. The problem with that though, I think, is that as the paragraph develops, uh, James calls on these people he's criticizing to respond in fundamentally Christian ways. Um, and we'll see that this develops as the paragraph goes, uh, but 15, I think, is clearest here. Uh, the people ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, 
we will live and do this or that. And while this, this formula, if the Lord wills, was very widespread in the ancient world, uh, all kinds of people were using it for, for all kinds of different religions, identifying the Lord in all kinds of different ways. Surely in the context of James, uh, the Lord here is either the Father or Jesus Christ um, in his context. So that certainly suggests these people are probably Christians, people who are parts of the community. And James again has discerned this tendency toward uh, an arrogance and um, a self-sufficiency that is out of keeping with the biblical picture and the biblical worldview of a God who controls everything. Note again, and I, I've talked about this before, but it's just you know worth mentioning, I think, that it, it's again speaking that James kind of uses as his way of getting into the issue. Uh, there are a lot of ways he could have talked about this. Come, uh, you know, you listen, you people who have this kind of attitude or who act in this way. But instead, he, he uses quotations. Uh, Come now, you who say, quote, and then he quotes them. And in verse 15, instead of that, you should say this, you see. And again, the significance of speech in James uh, as illustrative of who people are. Um, as a fundamental issue, uh, it just comes up here again uh, in, a, in a rather minor and offhand way. Now, the people he has in view here are, are, are clearly uh, 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 business persons uh, who in that culture would probably, again, have been considered uh, to be among the uh, uh, wealthier classes, among the upper classes, um, this would normally have been the case in that culture. In our culture, of course, uh, uh, traveling business persons are, are, are everywhere and belong to almost every class of our society. Uh, but in that culture, to be able to travel in this way, to go and to make a profit, to be this kind of a merchant, implied someone of a higher social standing, someone who was probably uh, fairly wealthy at least. And again, their attitude is expressed by what they're saying. Today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city. Note how James puts it here, showing he's really giving an illustration. You know, uh, this, this doesn't work well if he's thinking about something specific. This or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Um, people who are making plans to gain a worldly wealth, uh, very specific plans, where they're going, how long they're going to stay, what they're going to accomplish. Now, the structure of the paragraph, which you see displayed in front of you, uh, obviously focuses, as we've said, on these two verbs of saying in verse 13 and verse 15. You are saying this, you ought to say this other thing. So 13 and 15, you know, obviously stand out here as Paul, as Paul, I did it again, I thought it almost cured myself, um, as James' a central point in the paragraph. And, and uh, the rest of the paragraph uh, sort of uh, focuses on reasons why uh, this attitude is wrong and why they should adopt a different attitude. First reason in verse 14, the, 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 this very standard biblical teaching about the brevity and insubstantial nature of life. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. We might first just note that again, we have a kind of translation problem here that doesn't affect the meaning all that much. But uh, again, uh, conscious of the fact that uh, a lot of you do have Greek and are interested in Greek, um, I thought it might be worth just taking a quick look at uh, the different ways that we might want to translate uh, this particular verse. Uh, I've given you the uh, Greek there, which uh, of course you can see in front of you. Don't need to go into any further details about uh, that for the moment, but let me just point out a couple of issues uh, about that Greek there. Um, uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, note that I've, I've put in brackets here the, the word gar. Uh, 
little bit of a story, complete sideline, complete excursus, um, illustrating the truth that a little Greek can be a dangerous thing. I heard this story from one of my students who grew up in the South, and he said he was driving one night and listening to a radio preacher uh, who was, 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 was pretty proud about how much Greek he knew, you know, was really making a point about he's just not some ordinary radio preacher, but here is a preacher that knows his Greek, has, has, has insight into the mysteries of God because he knows Greek. So he's, 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 he's going on about a certain text, says, now in this here verse, you, you've got to know what all the words in the Greek are. And, and sometimes in English, that isn't brought out very well. For instance, right here at the opening of this verse, there is the Greek word yap. <laughs> well, that's what it says, right? Yap. <laughs> So every time I think of Gar, I think of that story. Uh, Got to know what those yaps are there for. Um, <laughs> you, you do have some, some, some textual variants in our verse about these Gars and where they are placed and so forth, which uh, can give us then different readings of the verse. Uh, and that's part of the issue here. Uh, the New American Standard Bible uh, takes all of this as kind of a single statement. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. Uh, so here it's taking our main verb, uh, epitasta, uh, sorry, epistasta, you do not understand or know. Uh, this article here then would sort of be uh, uh, an article that indicates the rest that comes here, the next clause is the object of that verb. And the whole thing then would be taken together. What your life of tomorrow will be, you see, is the way you would take that then. You do not know what your life, the life of tomorrow, will be. And that's what the New American Standard Bible is doing here in taking it that way. Most of the versions, however, uh, divide it up. And uh, those of you who have a Greek text in front of you will see that that's what our Greek text punctuation suggests uh, by putting uh, that... Um, well, I'm sorry, I, this is a different text than I was looking at yesterday. This, the Greek text I have puts only a punctuation mark here, where this one does. I was looking at a Greek text yesterday that put a mark of punctuation here, interestingly. At any rate, those punctuation marks, our point again, uh, are not original, obviously. Um, uh, most think that, that we should divide this into two parts, so that the poia begins a new statement here, uh, a new qu a question. So, just, so James will be saying two things. You don't know what tomorrow will be. You don't understand the tomorrow. You don't understand what tomorrow will bring, what will happen tomorrow. You have no way of controlling it. You have no way of predicting it. Um, what is your life? Then James would be sort of asking uh, his people. Um, uh, what is it? Answer, you are a mist, uh, a smoke, a vapor, however we translate this particular word here, all uh, getting uh, about the same thing. Uh, the, the yes? Text on the Bible does have a period there. Yeah, but I never look at the Byzantine text. <laughs> is that the only one that has it in the Bible works? Not on, <coughs> not on this one. Oh, boy. You know, see, I think my problem is I need a computer screen. Well, I do. I have a 24-inch monitor in my home office. Why do I have a 24-inch monitor in my home office? Because I can't see Hebrew vowel points anymore unless it's about that big. When I work on these laptop screens, sometimes all that escapes me. Uh, yeah? Westcott Hort has it as well there? Okay, well, that, I don't know where I got it. I, I, I saw it somewhere. Um, not important, really. Um, so however we translate, you know, again, I think the, the point James is making here is clear enough to go back to our outline. Life is short, it's brief, we can't predict it. We don't have the position, we can't be in the position of knowing or predicting the future. Uh, and of course, the, the, the imagery here of the mist or the vapor uh, is well known from a number of different Old Testament passages uh, as well. So uh, how foolish James is saying it is for people to make these kinds of plans. There's a certain arrogance there. Uh, 
about their ability to think things are just going to go on as they have. So instead, again, the, the point in contrast is to say, um, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Now, James obviously doesn't mean we simply verbalize this particular knowledge. Uh, he, he's talking about a speaking or saying that really is internal to us, that we take on board. So it's not just, you know, the, the, the flip it, if the Lord wills, which we can sometimes use rather unthoughtfully um, and just throw into our conversation. Um, obviously, James' point is you, you have to really mean that. You have to be grounded in that way of looking at reality. Um, if it, the Lord's will, uh, then you will do this or that. Now, there's a little bit of a question here, if you think about it, about what James means by this, if it's the Lord's will. He's encouraging people to, to, to put it that way. Um, and, and you could sort of ask the question, well, does James mean that this, bird, this business person, in this case, for instance, uh, is to say, well, well this is what I uh, am planning to do if the Lord enables my life to continue. Uh, you know, all that is always contingent in a general way on uh, God's providence and so forth. Or is he saying something a little bit more specific uh, that the businessman should, should, should be more carefully in asking, is it the Lord's will for me to go to this town or that town and how much time to spend there? Uh, is it a little more specific than that? Some think that's the case here. In the context, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not, it's certainly not a wrong thing to do, but in, in this context, it seems to me probably a more general comment in light of verse 14. Uh, instead of having this attitude that we're gonna go and do this and that, uh, recognizing that, that all things are in God's hands, that all is uncertain, um, uh, I need to uh, have that attitude about things. So note how James follows it up here. You ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. So life itself, James is saying, uh, is contingent on God's providence, uh, not on our plans or decisions. Verse 16, uh, again, continues this theme of why this attitude is wrong. And he comes back to then his reasons. Um, it's wrong because of arrogance. You are boasting in your arrogant schemes. Our versions translate in slightly different ways here because um, the uh, word here is simply in the Greek, in your arrogances, it, it's simply the plural. And um, probably the point James wants to make again is that you, you know this, this wrong kind of boasting, um, this, this, this inappropriate arrogance or pride takes its form in various ways various displays of arrogance in terms of the planning these people are doing. This kind of boasting, James says, is evil. And as we look at the structure, by the way, that I have on the, on the uh, slide here. Again, I don't know if this is controversial around here or not in terms of the way you're taught preaching, so forgive me if I'm stepping on anyone's toes. I don't intend to do that. Uh, but I, I, would, I would like to make the case that in a paragraph like this, when you're organizing a sermon, <clears throat> rather than simply moving verse by verse, which we might prefer to do, you know, it might be more effective in this case to organize your sermon around verse 13 and 15, the point James is making, and second point, the reasons for the point, so that you don't just preach straight through the text, but you sort of take the key ideas out of the text, even if they don't follow textual order. Now, all of this uh, makes verse 17 a difficult, thing, because here we have maybe uh, one of the, the clearest examples in James of a very abrupt transition. Uh, raising the question, why is verse 17 here? So then, if you know the good you ought to do and don't do it, you sin. It sounds like just a very, very general proverbial saying, which, which has at best, very general relationship to its context. Uh, Martin de Balius was, was one of the key 20th century interpreters of James, early in the century. Um, and, and he was the one who emphasized uh, that James uh, 
was what he called Paranesis, kind of the, tip, the, 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 the technical name that he gave the letter. Um, and, and, and he made a number of, of, of points about that, but said this was, he, he argued, a kind of typical ancient genre in which you just moved abruptly from sane to sane, often gathered from different backgrounds. So one of the things that Paranesis was, according to Martin de Balius, was very eclectic in that way, that you have people borrowing from everywhere, uh, and then just, just throwing sayings together without trying to connect them at all. Um, we, we've talked about that indirectly all week in one way or another. James certainly does borrow from a lot of sources. He's very eclectic uh, in the different sources as we've seen that he borrows from and uses. A and it is difficult sometimes to find sequence and order. And again, a lot of people reacted against the Baileus. Uh, clearly, I think most people agree he went to excess um, uh, in not finding any kind of train of thought in James at all. Um, uh, but again, w w granted the, the, the relationships between James and wisdom, we don't always have to see real neat connections. So in this case, for instance, I think in my commentary, um, uh, I, I conclude that, well, this probably is a sort of proverbial statement that, that was you know, used broadly uh, in early Christianity, uh, and that, that, but, but that James does deliberately put it here to sort of uh, kind of cap his argument. Uh, say, well, it, it, yeah, it's a general statement that applies a lot of places, but I'm applying it here. So he connects it uh, to his context by uh, using uh, in the Greek the, uh, the, the conjunction un, therefore. Um, and, and it's a way gen, then of just you know, hammering home his point uh, one last time. Okay? If you know what's good, you know what to do, and don't do it, you're sinning. So I've told you what you need to do. You need to acknowledge the Lord. You, you need to say, if he wills. And now that you know you need to do this, uh, then you'd better go ahead and do it. And so on the basis of this verse, you know, you have the famous distinction uh, that, that many want to make in Scripture, which I think is generally theologically and pastorally useful, sins of commission and sins of omission. That sin is not just things we do that we shouldn't. Sin also consists of things we should do but don't. It's a category that probably fewer Christians um, usually, you know, have as a live significant category in the way they think about their lives. Um, that there are things we are made responsible to do. There are things we are supposed to do, uh, failing to do which is sin also. So and that point's clear enough. Now, what, what's, what's, what's an interesting possibility uh, is that um, there is a little bit more going on here than this. Yeah, let me go to this slide. Um, and I'm a little bit more attracted to this idea than I was when I wrote the commentary. I think part of it is the very, very bad influence of my colleague Greg Beal. Um, uh, Dr. Greg Beal has his office right next to mine, and I'm, I, just, I just fear he's infected me with his passion to find Old Testament references everywhere. Um, I, I hope you understand I was speaking tongue in cheek. Greg and I are good friends. He, we're, we're, we, we have a really great relationship. I have tremendous respect for him. But some of you know that Dr. Beale is really into the Old Testament and the New. And when Dr. Beale gets into something, he gets into it. Uh, he jumps in with both feet. Um, and so he, he, he has a tendency to see all these really complicated and interesting Old Testament references everywhere. Um, and while I don't buy everything he does with that, I think there's a lot to be said for what he's doing. And I'm a little bit more inclined, maybe under his influence, to think that, that this might be part of what's going on here in James. So that, that verse 17 is not just kind of, you know, well, somewhat arbitrarily thrown in, but that, that maybe James is thinking about the context of Proverbs 3. Uh, he's quoted from that passage back in verse 6. Chapter 4, verse 6 is a quotation from Proverbs 3, 34. And certainly Dr. Beale and others are right that when our New Testament authors quote from an Old Testament text, they are often, if not usually, familiar with the whole context of that text. 
So, so they aren't just sort of coming and taking a proof text out of it, but they're, they're, they are often, you know, they know what else is there in the context. And they are thinking maybe about the context of that Old Testament quotation in what they write in their own context. So there's this, this, this continuing sort of influence on their language. That's what could be going on here because you will see that in Proverbs 3, 27, 28 in the Septuagint, and I, I put that in here because in this place, the, the Greek Septuagint differs from the Hebrew Masoretic text. So James would not be able to get this out of the Hebrew text. It could only be gotten out of the Greek text. But if he's reading it in the Greek text here, um, then you could see how there would be maybe this um, uh, cluster of ideas that, that uh, are picked up here a little bit in 413 to 17. Um, uh, so number one, there is of course uh, the concern about um, uh, doing good to the neighbor, uh, helping the, 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 the neighbor when it's in our power to act, you see. Uh, don't withhold good from those to whom it is due. Um, and then of course, you don't know what tomorrow will bring forth. That's very similar to what James has said here in verse 14. So there might be something to that idea that, that in this section of James 4, uh, having quoted this uh, particular text out of Proverbs 3, he has sort of in the back of his mind other themes in Proverbs 3 that he kind of just naturally brings into his uh, discussion here. So I think that's, that is a certainly broadly uh, appropriate way to think about our New Testament use of the old, not just direct quotation like this, but the broader influence of these key Old Testament passages on our New Testament authors, sometimes their wording and sometimes their concepts, and often, of course, both. Questions on that? Yeah. Is it possible at the end of that discussion that he's trying to warn them against the tendency to do nothing? Like, take, like people sometimes say, well, I'll pray about it, and they do nothing. If he use that as an excuse to say, well, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next year, so I'm not going to put myself out on a limb and help my neighbor. And that's why he tacks out on at the very end. It's possible, though, remember, that the helping the neighbor idea, that comes from Proverbs. That's not specifically here in James at this point. Um, Lest they should take what he just said, use that as an excuse not to do good because they don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that, 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 that's an interesting point. It, it, it could be that James is worried they're going to take what he's saying in that direction. Well, we don't know what's going to happen anyway, so why bother? Uh, that is a possibility. Yeah, I see that. Would you see any other you know, like instances of something similar? It looks like in 318 that you've got sort of a pithy proverbial generic the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace, but those who make peace, and maybe at the, the end of 20, uh, 226 that the body part of the spirit is dead, so faith in the works is dead. There's some kind of generic, almost proverbial statements that just kind of show up at the end of those sections similarly? <clears throat> Well, it, it, yeah, it, both those are a little bit pr pr proverbial, particularly the former one, 318. Both, however, are tied pretty specifically to their context. I mean, in 226, you have just James using another image for something he said three or four times already in the paragraph. And 318 is tied pretty closely to its context with the theme of peace, which he brought in in verse uh, 17. But, but in principle, yeah, we, we need to be open to these kinds of possibilities. You know, just, just, just cast our net widely and see what kind of connections we might come up with. Because again, I think more than we realize, our New Testament writers know the Old Testament so well. And uh, when, when, when they quote from it again, often they, they, they know what else is in the context. And it's not at all then unnatural to think that what they say in their context might continue to reflect that Old Testament context. Would you, it, it seems, well, kind of as, we to, as we've been looking at it, it's, um, even though they're sort of lo loosely, um, you know, every once in a while somebody seems to find that some similar connection or a vague connection between the sections so far as we've gone, it seems as though if you kind of go back to that wheel of life notion and your idea of a holistic 
Christianity in here. It's almost like he's kind of walking through a wheel circle of life showing the absolute absurdity of, of knowing and not doing in every instance. Mm. Each time mm. he's talking, this is, it's, this is, it's absurd to look at trials that you know God gives good gifts, but you don't see them joyfully, that they're, they're solidifying you and perfecting you. And that, that you, you know, you might even want to be teachers, but be, be careful of that because you're even telling people about it, but you may not be living consistent. Each one seems to be the absurdity. I mean, like, absurdity seems to tie almost all of them together. That it's absurd that you would, that you would believe and know yeah. these things, but not live them in a holistic, complete way. So even here, this idea of almost like an argument to say, guys, don't you get it? This whole thing, you, to know what's right and not do it, it's sin. Miss it, missing the completeness. So it's not just grounding this, but something more generally we should see filtering through the letter you're saying, that they're this, or what I would call a disconnect between, you know, what people claim to be and, and who they are in Christ and yet failing to follow through on that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's a key theme in James. That, that seems like that, that course of life aspect that there's no, there, there is no compartmentalization. Mm. If, if from the beginning of the letter we're finding that his goal is that you be perfected and complete, um, that, that it seems as he's identified God a few times as having been, he's, he's unmoving, not shifting. He, he's, he, he does, he's not drawn away by sin. He actually is solidified. I mean, he's, he's anchored. In, and if you're to be a believer, the whole idea is anchored in him. And we typically are either a vapor or this undulating ocean that, that he's seeking to, the whole Christian life to, is to be anchored. And if James really did watch Christ's life, he watched someone who never shifted and never undulated throughout all of the circumstances of his life. Mm -hmm. whole, I think your idea of the holistic element really is kind of what ties so many all, all of this together and that his use of that wheel of life is that no matter where we go on the spectrum, you can't compartmentalize. You can't say that you honor your brother or you know that you fulfilled the royal law yet show partiality. You can't you can't have all of have obeyed all of the law but the one and and think that you've obeyed all the law. No, I think those are all very good points. And I think that, you know, maybe your appeal to the wheel of life language, we, we talked about that, why James uses that expression there, which is a little cumbersome, a little bit unusual. And maybe his point is to, to again, talk about the, uh, in a sense, the unity of life in that way. The, the, the tongue is almost at the, at the center so that, that it, it ignites the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It sets the whole thing up. Why? Because, because you can't compartmentalize. Yeah. You can't be hating your brother and have it not affect everything else. You can't have a like life-dominating sin in one area and think that you can compartmentalize mm -hmm. that and have it not affect everything. I think the compartmentalizing problem is a good way to put it as well, yes. I, I, I agree. I wanted to, oh, yes, go ahead, sorry. I wanted to ask about uh, James' use of hyperbole. Do you see a lot of hyperbole in James? I certainly see some. It was a very typical device in ancient teaching. And you know, let's face it, we use it today quite a lot too. We don't always call it that or recognize it as such, but, but we often make points by exaggeration. So, so yes, I, I think James does do that. Uh, you, you think of some, something in particular here in this context, or? Uh, well, um, uh, I was studying the Gospels uh, fresh, and uh, I was looking at some passages where uh, the Lord Jesus in his teaching uses strong hyperbole, yeah. uh, exaggeration. And uh, I was wondering, as we go, as we go through James, if, uh, that's, if we see that typical exaggeration to make simple points. You, you, you certainly have some of that. I don't think you have as much in James as you probably have in the teaching of Jesus. And another um, um, technique that is often used in this material that we don't recognize as clearly as we should sometimes, uh, particularly in the wisdom material, and you get it in James, is the sort of implied restriction of a particular issue or word of advice to a particular context. Um, so when, when, when James will, will say things, 
um, uh, for instance, um, just looking at the passage uh, a little bit uh, earlier, you know, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning. Again, this is not a, a general statement, turn all your laughter into mourning, always. Uh, he's thinking of a particular context and situation to which it's addressed. So that's not quite hyperbole, you see, but it is a slightly different device in which you kind of assume a particular circumstance uh, and then give general advice for it, but, but there's always that assumption it's restricted to a particular set of events. I say that because some people have talked about hyperbole, for instance, especially in the teaching of Jesus, that I don't think is hyperbole. He means it strictly and literally as he says it, but there's an implication that it's restricted to, it, to a certain issue or, or, or context that we haven't recognized. And then if I, if I can just, just finish, finally you also then have a little bit, n not so much in James, but to some extent because of the wisdom material, the, 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 the typical tendency of wisdom to talk in generalities, but not universals, uh, where, where it's typical in Proverbs to have these promises, you know, if you do this, then that will follow. And it clearly doesn't mean if you do this every single time that will follow. What it means is generally if you do this, here's what the outcome will be. Uh, so we, we do have to recognize all those literary devices, as it were. Um, one of the reasons why I'm so grateful to, to come to Winterum and to hear a, uh, a teacher like yourself is that uh, you come with a very different perspective. Your work on the TNIV is a refreshing thing for me because in our circles, uh, we're very much on a literal uh, formal equivalence view. That's our, where we're trained. And one of the things that I'm appreciating is that uh, I think that in our preaching, maybe we use the word literal too often, and maybe when we use the word literal, we actually mean figurative. And one of the things I'm learning is that uh, uh, language is very colorful. Uh, and, and, and the language is very colorful in James, and that uh, 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 we have to grow hermeneutically to see the color or the emotion. Like how you just uh, uh, shared with us the imperatives that, that James uses. Uh, we need to learn how, how to interpret that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, in terms of these little, uh, well, I'm not sure what to call them, uh, literary devices perhaps, so things like hyperbole and, and generalization. Um, I have often told my students over the years and trying to, to help them learn to be good interpreters and exegetes that that 80% of good interpretation is this common sense. Um, by which I mean that, that sometimes because we are interpreting scripture, as opposed, let's say, to a, a Charles Dickens novel or something else, uh, we, 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 we think that, that, that the language of scripture has to work completely differently than language we use elsewhere. And I think that uh, without uh, subtracting anything from the inspiration of scripture, from its divine origin, from its divine authorship, we, we should feel comfortable in, in saying, and this has been the historic uh, position of the Christian church, that, that scripture is ordinary human language. It is divine language also. It is divine and human at the same time. Fully divine and fully human. Go back to the analogy we used the other day about divine agency and human agency. That is a uh, a kind of model that applies in a lot of different places. Scripture is fully divine. You can't say, well, this much is human and then God takes over here, you know? Uh, uh, no, it's, it's in every word, in every place. It is divinely given, inspired, all of it, everything divinely given, inspired. But at every point, it is also human language and shares the characteristics of human language in general. So biblical authors will exaggerate, they'll use hyperbole, they'll assume a context for what they're saying, just like we do in language all the time. And that's why I come back to the point, 80% of, of good biblical interpretation is just common sense. Read scripture and interpret it uh, as you would any other piece of literature. Restricted principle, but valid. It's restricted, of course, because ultimately scripture is, has a divine author, which, which means the way we put it together, especially, will differ. We will give it a different status, a different authority. 
uh, full truthfulness and so forth. We don't any other piece of literature. But at that level of literary devices, you know, uh, I think it's just, again, a matter of recognizing how they work, seeing them in scripture, and uh, interpreting then what they mean on that basis. One more point. Oh, yes, another hand up. You know, it's, uh, it's jarring because the previous verses are talking more about a worldview or life view, and yet then you have this therefore and a statement about doing uh, something. I wonder, is it too much of a stretch to say that verse 17 is a Janus that also looks to the next section about some rich people who knew very well some good things they ought to be doing? Yeah, that's a possibility. I mean, you're, 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 I, I made the point that, that James sort of focuses on the language of speaking in, in his basic, you know, construction of this paragraph, verse 13, verse 15. It is interesting that in terms of context, you know, in 17, uh, you don't continue to have that saying. And obviously the doing applies to what follows. So yeah, you, you could be right, yeah. Do you, do you understand what a Janus is, the word he used there? It's becoming used more often in, among the biblical interpreters of a verse or a section that looks both directions at once, uh, kind of a double-faced, you know, so a, a transitional verse that, that picks up what has come before it, but also is introducing what's after it. And you get a lot of those in wisdom material especially. Uh, uh, Bruce Waltke is on our translation uh, a, 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 a committee and when we were working through Proverbs, of course, he was working on his commentary on Proverbs and was pointing out how often you get these Janus uh, Proverbs uh, in the wisdom material that, 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 that look both ways like this. I just wanted to make one other point about this paragraph before we leave it. Um, uh, with these other influences we've talked about, obviously, again, we have James uh, sort of resting on the teaching of Jesus. Uh, picking up the concepts that Jesus talked about and sort of channeling them, funneling them now into a new and slightly different direction. But I, I don't think we can read this paragraph in James without thinking of uh, the parable of Christ here in Luke chapter 12, a well-known parable about the, again, arrogant rich man. Uh, this I will do. I'll tear down my barns, build bigger ones, uh, and so forth. Take like easy, eat, drink, and be merry. God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Who will get what you have prepared for yourself? It's even possible, and I, you know, I, here I'm really going out on a limb. Some of you might want to uh, warm up your chainsaws. But it, it's, it's even possible that when you see the combination of ideas here, not only the, uh, the, the Jesus condemnation of the person for their arrogance in, in making plans, but also the uh, condemnation of their wealth, uh, thinking that they're storing up wealth for themselves. Could, could, could this be in the back of James' mind and also help the transition into chapter five, verses one to six, you see? So that you have brought together these themes of, of arrogance and the abuse of wealth, which are sort of side by side in this parable. Maybe not, because the, perhaps it's a pretty obvious kind of combination, you know, and, and James not, need not be resting here on the teaching of Jesus. But, but it's interesting at least to, to speculate. Yes? What about the combination of the other parable about not laying up for yourselves treasures on earth, and moth and rest, fret and days, break your and steal, and then that little intersection there about the proper use of wealth, maybe in verse 17, whoever knows the right thing, because it's been sin. Yeah, so certainly as we'll, we're going to see in 5, 1 to 6, James clearly is picking up some of that language of the teaching of Jesus about, about you know, where your treasure is and so forth. So that, that's very clear there. We ready to move on? All right, uh, we want to spend a little bit of time on 5, 1 to 6 um, because this is one of the more significant paragraphs in Scripture on the whole issue of wealth. Uh, which is a significant issue in its own right, but, but is obviously one of those issues of uh, a special relevance for those of us living in a comparatively wealthy society. Um, so uh, th this is a matter that we need to spend uh, some good time on and reflecting on what James is saying, putting it in, in its biblical context, and, and just maybe helping each other uh, by way of application. Let's just kind of look over the paragraph first of all. Uh, it begins, and the main point is this 
uh, pronouncement of judgment. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. This opening um, uh, implies pretty clearly, I think, that James is now thinking about wealthy non-Christians. Although I'm going to want to qualify that just a little bit as we go. Uh, the language again of weep and wail, and because of the misery, uh, uh, is language that is used in the prophets to talk about judgment rather consistently. So we, we've talked about how James is so dependent on wisdom material and, and, and looked at that. Again, we're seeing now also that James is, is taking ideas from the prophets in a number of places here. And this is certainly wording that imitates the prophets. What James then does in the rest of the paragraph, and I've, I, I've suggested maybe there are four basic points he's making here, uh, is explain why these rich people are going to be suffering the miseries of judgment. Uh, and we'll have to look at each of these in turn. But it does seem to me that pretty uh, obviously the paragraph then divides into these four fundamental reasons why these people are to weep and wail because of the misery coming on them. Um, so let's talk about um, this matter of the rich people, an issue we, we brought up the other day, you recall, when we were talking about this language of rich versus poor in Scripture and, 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 the, and the scriptural context here. It's a, a somewhat complicated situation uh, because, first of all, obviously the language of rich and poor, you know, in terms of its basic meaning, uh, kind of the standard way we'll think about the words both in Scripture and in modern English have what I'm calling here an economic meaning. They're talking about uh, degrees of wealth, how many worldly goods a person has. The, the, the standard way we use the language, rich and poor, uh, which is the way Scripture uses the language uh, most of the time as well. Now, what we, we talked about the other day, you remember, if I could just return to our discussion, uh, is the fact that in the Old Testament, uh, the language of poor, uh, uh, which can also mean afflicted or oppressed or even humble, um, sometimes uh, sort of morphs over into more a focus on attitude. And the same happens, although less often, with the language of rich. So you remember our discussion, the, the poor in that ancient Israelite culture, looking at the old, thinking about the Old Testament now, uh, were, were sort of by definition, along with being poor, they were those who, who didn't have a real voice in the world, uh, who were uh, often afflicted and oppressed by the, 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 the wealthy, who had no basis in the world for any kind of stature or hope, and so tended to throw themselves on the Lord for their hope and their um, uh, sufficiency. And on the basis of that, again, there are those who say that at times in Scripture, the language of poor and rich then take on a purely theological meaning. So that in some passages um, where the word poor is used, there would be no reference to economic standing. Uh, but it would simply be talking about the attitude of a humble acceptance. And at the same time then with respect to rich, that it would not be a language that would talk about people who have a relatively large amount of worldly goods but it would be talking about people who are arrogant and proud and uh, not open to uh, the Lord and his grace and uh, be because they're too proud, they're too arrogant, they, they, they are self-satisfied. Um, a, a couple of texts where it's argued this, this happens. We talked to Matthew 5, 3 the other day, Proverbs 28, 6. Better the poor whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. Uh, 
or again, you, you see that the attitude is involved. Now, uh, what, what you should each do yourselves, if you really want to pursue this, of course, is to, is to take out your concordance um, and, and just look through these examples where the language is used in Scripture, Old Testament and New. Um, uh, when, when I have done that, at least, I, I have not been convinced that there's any place in Scripture where the word poor by itself or the word rich by itself is talking about attitude and not about economic standing. They're often combined, yes, that, that, that's clearly the case. But I, I'm not convinced that, that in Scripture the language is ever uh, without the economic meaning of the words. And here perhaps we have to again exercise what some would call a little bit of a hermeneutic of suspicion. I'm not trying to accuse people who've, do, who've done these studies of impure motives. That's not my point at all. But maybe we should at least ask ourselves whether we are a bit uncomfortable with uh, a kind of outright denunciation of rich people. Uh, because in our culture, uh, surely wealth is not necessarily a bad thing. We know people who are both wealthy and who are very fine Christian believers. And so we want to, we, we, there's a, t a tendency for us to want to say, uh, we, we, we can't just talk about people being rich as being, in some sense, uh, lacking spiritually. Uh, the, the, the we have to find a different category here. Uh, we're going to want to talk about this as we go today and look in terms of application. It's not a simple matter. Uh, but, but I do think when you look at Scripture, it's difficult to avoid the economic significance of the words. And so uh, third then, I think what we have is a, is a rather sometimes hard to sort of unpack combination of the economic and the um, uh, spiritual. So for instance, I suspect, I'm not sure about this, but I suspect that, that Jesus said on only one occasion, blessed are the poor. Uh, and that when he said that, he, he was talking about, again, this complex uh, against the Old Testament background of poor having both economic and spiritual meaning. And that Luke, in his version of what Jesus said, uh, highlights the economic side without necessarily uh, eliminating the uh, spiritual side. Matthew, when he quotes the same saying of Jesus, brings out the um, uh, uh, spiritual side without necessarily eliminating the economic side. So blessed are the poor versus blessed are the poor in spirit, you see. Um, I think that might reflect this sort of way in which this language was being used in a rather complex way. Now, if we come then back to James 5.1, when, when he, when he, when he, uh, utters this condemnation on rich people. I think it is clear that these are implicitly non-Christian rich people. They are being condemned for their uh, wrong attitudes. But if I can come back to something I said a little earlier, I, I do think we have to be careful not simply to then say, oh, this has no relevance to Christian rich people. Uh, no. Uh, because I think that this functions also to say um, Christian rich people can sometimes harbor some of these attitudes um, that we need to identify and see in them. And even though they are not being condemned for them because they are in Christ uh, and because these attitudes have not gone to the extreme that they do for, let's say, non-Christian rich people, nevertheless, those tendencies are there. So what I'm saying is this. Often we come to James 5, 1 to 6, and we say, well, of course, this is directed to non-Christian rich people, so it doesn't have any relevance to believers. No, I think it still does have relevance to believers in two ways. Number one, it has relevance in, in terms of uh, this similar kind of attitude among people who are rich or whatever level we call that at. But also then, it... Um, and something we're going to come back to, uh, I think Calvin's words are very wise in talking about why James puts this paragraph here. Uh, why to denounce these non-Christian rich people 
in front of a Christian audience. Uh, I think Calvin has it exactly right. James has a regard to the faithful that they hearing of the miserable end of the rich might not envy their fortune. And also that knowing that God would be the avenger of the wrongs they suffered, they might with a calm and resigned mind bear them. There is a warning Calvin is suggesting to Christian believers when we see why God is denouncing these rich people uh, that we be very careful that we do not fall into their attitudes, that we not begin uh, implicitly seeking their status by the means they have attained it. Uh, and uh, particularly it will be incumbent on Christian rich people to look very, very carefully at themselves to see whether these kinds of attitudes that James denounces here have begun to creep into their way of looking at themselves or their wealth or their status. <clears throat> well, we'll see as we, we make the transition into 5, 7 through 11 uh, that, that uh, Calvin, I think, is especially on target when we look at the sequence of thought that I think James intends here as we move from this first paragraph, chapter 5, to the second. Or is he speaking hypothetically to a rich class of people for the benefit of poor believers, poor Christians? Well, I mean, in, in a sense, it's hypothetical. That is, in the sense that it's very unlikely when James writes the letter or dictates the letter, he has a particular group of rich non-Christians in front of him, you know. So, so he, he has that group right there and he's speaking to them. But he, he's, 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 he's addressing uh, this rich people that everyone knows are out there in the culture. Um, uh, in order to make his point. It's a bit of a literary device again. Perhaps, I mean, the teachers, those teachers that he was also rebuking, uh, the white teachers that he might be as well. the, the, the teachers might be those who are aspiring to this status or something? Or? I'm saying, is there a relation between those? Is, is it true that in the ancient world, the teachers were generally wealthy? No. No, usually not. At least in Jewish society, the, 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 the rabbis were typical of sort of identifying with the people uh, and living with the people and, and not really being that significantly socially or economically advanced over them. Um, some of them uh, were, some of them weren't. It certainly differed a lot. If you were looking for more of the rich, the upper class, that would be usually in Jewish society at that time have been more the Sadducees, who were sort of the people of the establishment in a sense, who were the ones who were more open to, uh, for instance, collaborate with the, 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 the Romans in order to, to gain power and prestige and status. So you don't think there's any relation between the teachers of, of chapter 3? I don't think so, no. Uh, I, I don't think there's any relationship between the teachers you know, James is warning about becoming a teacher and, um, and chapter five here. Then as now, the career of Christian teaching is not the career to choose if you're looking for worldly wealth. Yeah, in, this, in this context, that's why my question was, in the ancient context, was that, a, was that different? Yeah, and that, it, again, the, the, the teachers were, on the whole, not part of the wealthy. Obviously, the, there were exceptions, but on the whole. Yeah. Um, the, the combination of the rich in the Old Testament being sort of an ethical category as well as a monetary category, is that related to the fact that under the Old Testament law, there was a lot of mechanisms put in place to keep people from falling down or going up too much? You know, they're resetting the clock every seven years and such. So if you got rich, you had to necessarily sin. There is something to that, yes. And here's again where analysis of how language works within cultural categories is important. And again, I want to suggest this very cautiously. But, but to some extent, perhaps, the Old Testament was written in a culture where if you were rich, almost by definition, you were rich because you had done some nasty things to get there. Um, uh, that's sort of the way the culture worked, in a sense. Now, again, some of that, of course, is, is um, exaggeration. Some of it is 
uh, generalization that wouldn't always hold true, but probably more so in that culture than in ours. So when, when, we, when, we, when we take the language of rich from that culture and then look at it in our culture, there is a little bit of, of, of a transition needed there. In other words, I think, uh, here again, I'm, I, I'm, uh, I'm on very, very, what, what's the word I'm using for, looking for here? Not quicksand, that's putting a little bit too strongly. Shaky ground, maybe, is a better way to put it. Uh, in saying what I'm saying, vast generalization. But I suspect, and I'm not an expert in this at all, but I suspect that it is easier in our culture to become rich and stay righteous than it was in that culture. In other words, that the biblical language of rich and its tendency to be associated with, with arrogance and with oppression of the poor and so forth, uh, that that was, was more typical of that culture than it is of ours. And, and we probably have to do a little bit of translation then in terms of, of how the language functions over those cultures. I think that's the point you're making, isn't it? That I think it's probably a valid one. Let's turn back to this very um, uh, stark and strong passage about wealth in James and look a little bit more carefully at why he is condemning these rich people. Why are the miseries of the judgment uh, coming upon them? Uh, first, they have a wrong attitude toward their wealth. Um, and again, there are different ways we can sort of look at the organization here. Let me go back to my text. Um, your wealth has rotted, moths have eaten your clothes. At a certain point, that, that talks just about, you know, the fact that worldly things don't last. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. James, again, using imagery from the Old Testament. Um, here. And then I think we get the real sense of what James is after in these verses here at the very end. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. In other words, the, the corrosion, the rot uh, that has set in uh, has the sense that, that these rich people have accumulated things they've not even been able to use. Uh, they have hoarded things for themselves, which have been of use to nobody. So there is a condemnation here of their uh, acquiring so much for themselves. Note also the phrase, in the last days. You know, I've, I've highlighted this uh, kind of language that James uses twice in our paragraph. The New Testament teaching is that with the coming of Christ, his death, his resurrection, the pouring out of the Spirit, uh, the last days are inaugurated. That, that's why we can talk um, uh, accurately and appropriately about the New Testament church as an eschatological church, uh, because they are experiencing the fulfillment of many of God's promises for his establishment of the kingdom. So the New Testament consciousness here is of people living uh, in the last days. Sometimes we have a very bad way of thinking about eschatology, by the way, um, because from the standpoint of the New Testament, there, is, there are these two moments, first coming of Christ, second coming of Christ. Uh, the first coming of Christ, the last days are inaugurated, uh, and uh, New Testament writers are clear, no one knows how long that period is going to last, uh, uh, and then it's going to be climaxed by the second return of Christ, the second coming of Christ, at some point in the future. But, but, but rather than their consciousness being, oh, we're sort of living in the world as it has always been, and we're looking forward to this great transition when Christ comes back in the future, their attitude was much more of the decisive transition has already taken place. And for Jesus' first uh, coming, the whole world has been transformed and changed, and we are now part of that. And yes, we're looking forward to something yet to come that's going to be the next stage and, and finalize matters. But they had the sense, again, as James says here, of being in the last days. So not only have these people hoarded wealth, 
but they've done it in the last days. They've done it in this era of the fulfillment of God's promises uh, in the renewed kingdom, uh, which makes it uh, doubly sinful in a sense, that they have failed to see what the time is. They have failed to recognize that they're living in the last days, and those days might be short. Remember the, the, the consistent New Testament teaching here about the fact that Christ could be coming back at any moment. The days uh, uh, may indeed be short, and how especially foolish in the last days uh, to be hoarding wealth. Now, there's another possible implication of what James is saying here. Um, Granted, these background texts, here we have to be cautious because James is not at all explicit about this. But granted these background texts, it, it, it might be that there's a, a slight, slightly uh, additional nuance that James intends. That not only these rich people hoarded wealth, uh, they've done it in the last days, but by hoarding it, they have not appropriately used it to help others. Sirach. Uh, 29, 9 through 11, um, uh, makes this point rather clear. Note, it uses the language of laying up treasure. Uh, that is similar, of course, to what we have here in James. Uh, you lose your silver for the sake of a brother or a friend, and do not let it rust under a stone and be lost. Jesus says something a little bit like that. 1233 of Luke's gospel, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will never wear out. A treasure, note the language of treasure here again, in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Point again is, is similar, isn't it? Don't uh, store up uh, money and material things for yourself when they could be used to help others. And that is a treasure that uh, can never be taken away. So again, the first point that James makes here in some ways um, uh, is um, a very controversial one, as we'll see, and related also to verse 5. Let me just uh, come back to our outline and I can maybe talk about these t together. Um, verse 5 is saying somewhat, something like this, so I'm going to skip to that now. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You fatten yourselves in the day of slaughter. You see the parallelism between this verse and two and three, I think, because they both conclude with this language of the time we're living in. Now, you fatten yourselves in the day of slaughter could also be translated, you fattened yourself for the day of slaughter. Uh, and uh, the versions uh, here um, differ a little bit on how they uh, take that. Um, just looking here at the um, translations, if I can get to the right place. Um, uh, TNIV, in the day of slaughter. ESV, in a day of slaughter. Um, NLT, for the day of slaughter. NASB, in a day of slaughter. Net Bible in a day of slaughter. So the, the, the question here whether, is whether James is saying um, you are, are fattening yourselves for the day of judgment that's yet to come. You know, the day of slaughter, kind of the imagery here of, of, uh, of, of the judgment of God. Again, James is using prophetic language here to talk about the day of judgment. Or again, is it a little bit like uh, verse 3, and we would use the preposition in to suggest, you know, that th that day is very near now. It's impending. Uh, the, the judgment could come at any moment. And so the language of in might suggest more the idea of it being uh, very close to us. It, in any case, it's a very, um, a very powerful metaphor, isn't it? Just like think of cattle being fattened for slaughter. Uh, so here these rich people are fattening themselves and they think that they have all these goods that they're going to enjoy. And James says, you know, you, you're just setting yourself up uh, for, for the, uh, the slaughter, for the judgment to come. Very strong language. Now, what's, well, 
I'll, I'll come back to this if I might. Let's go through the other points first. Uh, verse two, I'm sorry, verse four, point two. Um, here, James, again, reflects uh, a lot of Old Testament tradition. Uh, there, there's an awful lot in the uh, law about this um, uh, in, in, in terms of, of God's requirement for his people Israel. Uh, again, culture helps here to understand a little bit that that in this culture, many laborers were day laborers. They would be hired for a day and they needed the money from that day to buy their food for that evening. It was, it was a day-to-day -day culture. Um, and so to withhold wages from workers uh, uh, was a very serious thing Indeed, and again, the Old Testament law is filled with various kinds of injunctions about this. Uh, so it might be again that there were people in James' audience who were actually doing this, that he knows of rich people uh, who were like this. Uh, and some of the commentaries uh, point out how at this time in the ancient Near East, the Middle East, uh, from where James is writing, Israel and surrounding territories, uh, there was a, a pretty significant accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few wealthy landowners. And you have a number of texts from that era that talk about the tensions uh, and, and the cultural conflict that this was creating. So, so this could, again, be reflecting situations James actually knows about. But to some extent, James simply may bring it in because it's part of the traditional criticism of the rich as well. This is what the rich habitually do. They're looking out after their own interests, even if it's bringing significant harm to the poor. And then finally, uh, verse six is the most difficult to interpret in our passage. Uh, the problem here is what it is that the rich people are actually doing here. Um, uh, the, the, the question here partly is the uh, identity of the righteous one. In the text here in the Greek, you have uh, James accusing these people of condemning and murdering with an article, the righteous one. And in the TNIV, we tried to sort of steer between the options and keep it open. We translated, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one. Because some take this to be a generic reference to righteous or innocent people. That is the poor who are being oppressed or something. Others take this to be a reference to Jesus the Messiah. There's, there's some basis for seeing this language of, in the Greek, dikaios, or the righteous one, as a messianic title in the New Testament, going back especially to Isaiah 53. Uh, so again, there are differences of opinion among interpreters here. Uh, is James saying, you are condemning, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, as the NLT has it, you have condemned and killed innocent people. Just, just a generic uh, reference to, to people like this, maybe by withholding their wages, verse four. Or is this a reference to uh, uh, a particular person, Jesus, that these people uh, uh, are accused of condemning and killing, maybe wealthy Jews whom James suggests are complicit, sort of, in the establishment that, that, that did uh, bring Jesus to condemnation, that they are belong to that class in a sense uh, that uh, 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 couldn't handle the teaching of Jesus and reacted against him. Uh, I think it's probably a reference just to innocent people in general, uh, the, the righteous as it were, uh, uh, and that we might have again here the uh, language of killing um, as a hyperbole to talk about, you know, depriving the poor of what they need to live on. That, that in, in effect, uh, these rich people are not only condemning them, and we have a lot of evidence from Amos and other Old Testament prophets about the way wealthy people would use the court system to their advantage, you know, condemn the property, 
uh, of uh, innocent poor people who couldn't defend themselves and take more land for themselves and so forth. So the condemning and then the murdering in terms of by depriving the poor of the money they need to buy their food. Uh, by not sharing your wealth with them, you are in effect sensing, sentencing them to death. They don't have enough money to eat. They don't have enough money to provide for their health. And so in effect, you're killing them. I think that's probably what James intends here. Let me pause and see if you have questions on kind of just the interpretation of first before we look more at, at application, significance, was the Apostolic Church socialist? I think that that's difficult to answer because socialist or let's say uh, another word like capitalist um, uh, are, are modern uh, conceptions of society that probably don't apply to first century society. Uh, so I don't, I don't think that question is easily answered. Uh, because we're kind of assuming a modern system of goods and services uh, uh, that was foreign to the ancient world. Well, um, maybe socialist was the wrong word. Uh, the concept of koinonia, you know, an acts where there is a common property, uh, people sell their property to provide for the common good of the, of the most needy within uh, the church. Um, do you see a lot of that in James, that dynamic of, of uh, an obligation to give? Yes, obligation to give, no requirement to hold all things in common. You do, have, of course, have that reference to the, the, that happening in the early church, Acts 2. And I think we have to avoid two extremes interpreting the text. Uh, one extreme that I, I've heard from some more capitalist type interpreters, if I may put it that way, says, yeah, the, Acts chapter two, the Jerusalem church shared all things in common and look what happened. They ended up being poor and they had to send relief to them, you see? So that shows you, you know, well, what a mistake that economic way of going is, you see? Uh, whereas of course others say, well, here we have in Acts chapter two, a presentation of, of how the church should always be, that this is the ideal, the church should always hold all things in common. Uh, I think we understand that, that you always have to interpret these statements about what the early church did in light of principles elsewhere in scripture because what they did might have been very much tied to their own circumstances or situation or culture. So the way I would prefer to answer that question is to say, and I like koinonia as a good starting point, the scriptures do require that there be this heartfelt, loving fellowship among brothers and sisters in Christ. And in each context, we have to ask, what is the best way to facilitate that kind of fellowship? In some situations, it might be sharing all goods in common. In other situations, it might not be. I don't think scripture tells us how that's to be done in each circumstance, but it does call on us to uh, a sacrificial fellowship of love among brothers and sisters in Christ. So, and that, that's where the word koinonia, I think, really does provide a good starting point for us in terms of the principle we're all trying to get at. I think the principle is really good, but just out of curiosity in Acts, it seems like Peter addressed that and Isaac said, wasn't it your own to do it the way you wanted to, basically you didn't have to do it. So are we to draw from that that it was a voluntary Thing, that they didn't that on oh, I got pretty clear. It was a voluntary thing. And elsewhere in scripture, you have references clearly to people who have private property of some sort. When, when Paul encourages people to bring their money to the service on Sunday morning, 1 Corinthians 16 and so forth. So, so again, you don't have a clear, consistent picture in scripture on all of that. In Acts chapter 2, yes, it did, did seem that that was the case. And again, Ananias and Sapphira got in trouble not so much by withholding their money, but by lying about it. You know, well, they got, got into more than trouble, I guess. So. Putting it a little mildly. Yeah? Why does verse 5 in TNIV, that's what I'm trying to say, the word <coughs> heart, get fat in yourselves instead of your heart? Um, uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about why we we uh, did that there. Um, because the way it's translated in TNIV, it's, it's trying to, try to give 
I understand it as a, as a physical, <coughs> but you're just trying to convey a physical idea of being fat. Is that true or? Oh, no, no, no. Missing, oh, no. Missing the mark no, that, 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 that's missing the, 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 the metaphor entirely there. Um, yeah, I'm not, I would have to look at that a little further and ask why we did that. I think, I think maybe part of the problem is, is trying to communicate the biblical sense of the word heart, which, which, which is not often used the same way in modern English, or at least sometimes isn't. You know, heart in scripture, the lave, the cardia, is the, 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 the true inner person, uh, that which represents who we truly are. It's not like our emotional side or something. So that's why it can be hard in some contexts if you translate those words with modern English heart, you kind of convey the wrong idea about it. But I'm, I'm not sure why we did that here, to be honest. I'll have to think about that and, and look back at that. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I'm just thinking on the, on the common reader that you said, that TNI is trying to read. Yeah. They, they probably not get the idea of what's a little of heart. Well, uh, yeah, and, and, but it depends on what idea they're going to get from that. You have fattened your hearts. Um, your soul. I was thinking on the, on the idea of coveting. You have fattened your hearts. No, you know, no I, see, I don't think that's, that, uh, that's what, what it means. You have fattened your true persons. You, you have fattened um, who you truly are. Um, it's not the soul exactly. It's not our contemporary heart. So how to get that across becomes the challenge then, I think. Yeah, in no translation, you have to keep the metaphor as a scripture, and sometimes people might miss the metaphor. True, well, you know. Well, he's he's comparing Christians, or the, the, he's, in, in, in this case, he's comparing these wicked rich people to cattle who are being fattened, you know, and you can picture the whole process of, uh, of a steer being fattened and, and being put in a feedlot so it gains a lot of weight so when you slaughter it, you get more meat from it. That's the metaphor. And James says, you wicked rich people, uh, what you've done, you've, you've hoarded this wealth, you've accumulated goods and things for yourselves, and, and all you've done, in effect, in accumulating those things is fatten yourselves for the day of slaughter, you see. The um, other possibility here, I don't, I don't know that this would be relevant. Uh, the biblical languages have a variety of ways to indicate a reflexive notion. In other words, the yourselves. I don't know whether that would have played a role here or not. I'll have to think a little bit more about that. Now, oh yeah, one more. Possible that James could also be referring to they have in Jezebel where they condemn and murder Nabal? Well, I certainly think that could be one of the biblical stories in the background here. Yes, um, it's one of the more 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 pointed biblical stories of how you have someone with wealth and power um, uh, doing this kind of thing to the poor. Yes, there, I mean I, I won't. Say, I, I don't think it's a direct allusion to that story, but I suspect that's one of the more obvious stories about the kind of problem that James is, is addressing here. So yeah, it's a very relevant text to bring in, I think. If I were preaching uh, this text, that's probably where I'd go to kind of flesh out what, uh, what this looks like. Was Nabal horrible? I mean, he had... Is, I, I don't, when I read the story of Nabal, I don't get the idea that he was a poor I, man. I don't remember that the, the scripture com, uh, completely talks about that, but the, neither does James. He talks about the innocent here. Uh, so it, it's, it's, mo it's more, again, it's more here the flavor, you know, of those who don't have the same clout as other people have. It's not so much economic in this case as it is status and prestige and power. Yes? I was in Wheaton, but in Southern California, this 5, 1 to 6 is so relevant. Up and down San Fernando Road, we have day laborers. We have people hiring them for the day. Uh, it's a very, very contemporary, relevant thing, you know, when you have really dirt poor people uh, and who are dependent for the, how we pay them if we hire them uh, to feed their families at night. And God has just convicted my own heart at times when I say, ah, they're all illegals uh, to Hades with them, you know, and uh, go on. When, um, uh, you know, James 5, 1 to 6 doesn't say that. 
Um, and it really condemns my own uh, arrogance. <coughs> you know, with all the illegals, or, you know, you know, who cares about them? Uh, when the, uh, the Old Testament says that we should care for the sojourner and the stranger in our midst, mm -hmm. ah, it's just very, very convicting. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think we can uh, excuse our own responsibility by just saying, well, they're here illegally, uh, they're a drain on our system. Uh, all I'm saying is that this is a very contemporary relevance yeah. that I, I'm wondering how I apply it in my own life mm -hmm. and my own attitude to the poor. That's a very good point. Um, a, a, a brother in the break here from the Philippines was talking about the habit, you know, there of, 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 of hiring workers in the homes and paying them almost nothing, giving them no time off. You know, that even Christians, I think, doing that, not even giving them time off to go to worship or something, you know, and yeah, and so you're, you're, a lot of parts of the world, I think this is, this, is the, this is exactly where people are. I think that's a very good point. Yes? Where then do we find the balance between, say, you know, illegal immigrants are getting paid $2 to work for a whole day or a whole week, which is certainly wrong, and we certainly, certainly shouldn't be saying to Hades with them, but at the same time, they're breaking the law. The fact is, Romans 13 says, says that we're going to obey the law. Peter addresses it in, both in one of his epistles, I don't remember which one. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to obey the law, but we're supposed to care, care for and care about these people. And what do we do beyond giving, a, giving them a comfortable ride to the forest? Well, again, I, 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 would, I would not like to turn this into a form uh, of debate on immigration policy because it's very, the, the issue is complicated. But I think the point is that, yeah, people may break the law, but does that mean we shouldn't be helping them? That's, I think, the question in terms of the immediate situation people actually are in. You know, I think sometimes of myself and I feel a bit uncomfortable at Romans 13 because of the speed I usually drive on expressways. Um, uh, and if I were to get into an accident uh, and someone would say, oh, well, you know, you're getting what you deserve, you're, you drove too fast, you broke the law. Uh, you know, I, I think at that point, whatever our view on the policy is, these people are here, uh, whether they should be here, shouldn't be here, legally here, illegally here, and it's just too easy to sort of uh, justify our lack of care uh, of, of outreach uh, on those kinds of bases. So I, I think, I think the, to me, the point still, still stands. Um, but don't you think the point of this is that they've taken advantage of the poor and they've not taken... Yeah. I mean, if I'm gonna... I've had some of those laborers on occasion who were hired by other people working on my house or something, and I, I want to make sure they're paid for sure. And they told me, hey, you need that money. I was like, on the bank, quick, and get the money so they can get paid. It seems like the issue here is that they are taking, we're getting into all these other issues that James is addressing the issue of taking advantage of the poor. When you've got the wealth and the riches, you've used them and you've not taken care of them like you right. rightfully should. Anybody, what would be not be fair for any of us? Mm -hmm. If I was the poor guy working and doing that, I would spend my paycheck at the end of the day. That seems to be the main issue, not how well, I feel about an illegal immigrant. No, but not no. About I, I think. I would disagree a little bit. I think that's the issue in the uh, second and fourth points. But, but that, that turns our attention to the first and the third point, where, where I think you could make the case, it's not explicit as we've seen, but I think you could make the case that what James is saying here, it is sinful to have too much for ourselves when so many are without what they need to live. In other words, and this is something I struggle with, trying to figure out uh, what the biblical principle is, and then even more so have tr trouble, how do you apply it? How do you put it into effect? There is a suggestion here. Well, let me, let me ask you, do you think there might be a suggestion here that, 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 that it can be uh, displeasing to the Lord simply to have too much? However you use it, whatever your motivations are, as fair as you are, is there a point where you say, uh, and we, who knows where to draw the line, and we don't have the right to do that, we can't do that, but that at a certain point you say, a person who has X amount of money 
when so many don't have enough, that that in itself is sinful. Now, that's a very uncomfortable because we all know people who, again, have great wealth, who are sincere, fine Christian people. But again, at, at this point, what the, what, the, what the text seems to be saying makes me uncomfortable there because I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I want to go to that person and say, you know what? I, I know you're trying to fund a lot of Christian causes. You're, you're, you're sincere in your conviction about Christ. But you know what? Just having as much as you have might be displeasing to the Lord. So I'm just, I raise that because that seems to be some of the, that seems to be the suggestion that James is making here. In which case, again, you know, it, it's not just a matter of, um, uh, well, this day labor isn't working for me, so I obviously have a responsibility for someone working for me to pay them well. But if I am living with a certain lifestyle in uh, my culture uh, and others don't even have what they need to live on, is there something that is wrong about that? I, where the okay. The personal part of it comes in, absolutely. We have to yeah. do something there. But the, the, um, so, so again, I, 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 think, I think that's one of the real um, uncomfortable rubs of this passage for me. And again, I, 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 let me tell you, I am uncomfortable. I live in a very wealthy Chicago suburb, and I have some good friends who are very wealthy people, who have a, a lot of money and are fine Christian people, probably better, better Christian than I am. Uh, you know, and th their wealth and status and position in society have enabled them to do things that they wouldn't have been able to do without that wealth and status and place in society. And I acknowledge that as well. But I, I do think that, that whoever we are, whatever level we're at, you know, and, and we're all probably at different l levels here to some extent, um, I think a text like this force us, you know, to ask really hard questions about um, how much should I have in light of how little others have? Um, and again, that, that can apply to almost any level we're at because you can be comparatively poor and still have sort of this sinful, acquisitive urge and a selfish desire to hoard. You know, you can do that at any level of the economic scale, as I think we all know. The first place they're going to turn is the Job and Abraham. That's how the Christian's going to answer your question. That, that, well, Job had that there is this tradition yeah. in the Old Testament especially about um, God blesses his faithful people with wealth. Um, they have way more. That, that, how would you respond to them in light of James? Um, uh, number one, we have to ask about whether this is part of a distinctly New, New Testament Christian ethic that is a movement from the old because those movements obviously take place. So that's the first thing we need to ask is kind of the testamental question. Um, the, the second question we need to ask is even in the Old Testament itself, as Bauckham points out in his book, the, the kind of uh, imagery there of the uh, righteous, satisfied person is someone who is content with simply what they have. Uh, and it, it, it's not a lot. And it's not a desire to get more. Uh, so I think that's part of the picture, even in the Old Testament itself, where you have, we have to look at the whole picture of Old Testament teaching about wealth and what true satisfaction means in life. And that, you know, I think that's the point that's so important to make whatever we do with some of this material is, is to help people understand how to be satisfied with where they are. I talked about this acquisitive urge. I, I know I struggle with that I, in, in a quite remarkable way. It hit me about, what, maybe it was turning 50 that did it, but seven or eight years ago. It wasn't just turning 50, though, but I mean, I, I was the typical uh, person from a modest family background, uh, got through school, uh, partly on scholarships, uh, finished my PhD, started teaching, quickly ended up with five kids. Uh, I remember my first year at Trinity, my total salary for the year was $6,000, and I was very glad to have it. Of course, a lot of other things were cheaper back in those days too, just after the earth cooled. Um, <laughs> but, um, 
we, 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 we struggled for years, you know. I remember our, our, our seminary president, my first or, or, or second year on faculty, you know, saying, now make sure you're all putting X do amount of dollars away in your retirement fund because, uh, you know, that's going to be a wonderful thing for you to retire, you know. And a couple of us just looked at each other and kind of wanted to say, well, you know, if you paid us a little more, I might be able to do this. But at this point, I'm just f very thankful if my kids get fed at the end of the day, you know. And there are many days we said, where's... We don't know where we're going to get bread for the next day, and a student wife baked us a loaf of bread and dropped it off or something. And most of us have those stories. We struggled all those years. And suddenly, and I don't know how this happened, our kids grew up and left. You know, if, if you hang on long enough, you keep getting raises in your salary, whether you're doing your job well or not. Uh, uh, and of course, my books are on the bestseller list, so that just brings in tons of income. But, 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 but suddenly, my wife and I, Look to each other, you know, we've got disposable income for the first time in our lives. For, you know, almost for the first time, we actually have to make a decision how we're going to use our money rather than knowing where every cent's, cent's going. And boy, we really felt the strength of this. Oh, now we're at this point, we can start to acquire some things, you know. And, and I, I, was, I was astonished how quickly I moved into that mode of thinking. Uh, you know, and just so for my own life, I know how I continue to struggle with that, you know, and ask questions about uh, I, I absolutely have to have this new camera lens. Clearly, God wants me to use <laughs> my cameras to, to have recreation, to, to take photographs of the creation He has made as ministry. So, obviously, you know, the thousand bucks for that new lens is appropriate money spent, you know, but how easy it is for all of us to begin doing that sort of thing and just lose sight uh, because that's how our culture, you know, suggests you are rewarded and how you get ahead and how you get honor. Uh, and, and I find it so hard to resist that sometimes. I do, personally, at least, and I, I suspect most of us struggle a bit with that. I just uh, see how many times James makes reference to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and I'm just thinking right here um, from where Jesus, teaching his disciples to pray, said to pray, first of all, your kingdom come. So it's not about hoarding up wealth here, <coughs> since we live in the last days. And then also, um, he continues to say, give us this day our daily, daily bread. bread. Yeah. And then later on in 633, he says, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then everything else will be provided. Yeah, it, it, all of that, I mean, there's a lot of the teaching of Jesus that James is sort of reflecting indirectly here, because as, as we know, G Jesus did have a lot to say on these themes. So anyone else want to tackle this or jump into this? Uh, I, I do have a couple of more overheads. Let me just get to those before I forget. See, I still call them overheads. That's how old-fashioned I am. Um, um, this, yeah, this is stuff that uh, I think we all know about. Just, just filling in some of the background here. So, you know, the, 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 I'm going to come back to Psalm 37 in a bit. Um, but, but, but how much of this background, you know, there is for what James is saying here. Um, we've already talked about these basic principles, I think. And um, I did, did want to just uh, conclude by, first of all, a recommendation. I, I think Craig Blomberg's book is the best I know of on the theme that we're talking about. Um, I'd recommend that highly as a, as a biblical exploration, biblical theological exploration of the topic. Of course, we're, we're familiar with a number of other books that are more sort of practical in terms of uh, application and cultural analysis, but uh, in terms of a biblical theology, I'd recommend Craig Blumberg's book on that. Uh, and then just, you know, moving elsewhere in Scripture, uh, the, the other thing, of course, I think a lot of us struggle with is what this principle of equality that Paul enunciates in 2 Corinthians 8 should look like in practice. Um, where, again, you know, Paul is concerned that, that there are some believers who have a lot and some who don't have too much, and that he encourages giving to take place so that there might be equality. And then we ask, you know, what would that look like uh, if it were a principle I began to seek to live by? Equality with whom? In what culture? 
uh, at what level, how do you measure it? You know, uh, so th that, that brings a whole host of questions along the way. Also recommend to you a, a little bit more radical, but maybe appropriately so, the, the well-known books of, of Ron Sider on this question as well. Uh, Ron Sider, S-I-D-E-R. I think he, he's just recently redone his uh, kind of classic book, Rich, Agents, Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, um, which again probes some of these uh, issues. And then a book I've not had a chance to read yet, but I know a lot of people have recommended it to me. Uh, is it Randy Alcorn? Is that the name? The Treasure Principle, I think? Yeah. Uh, uh, I have a lot of people recommend it to me. It's on my reading list. Uh, but I haven't gotten to it yet, but <laughs> apparently that's a pretty good uh, attempt to look at some of this and again, move it more into a practical application format as well. Yes? In the area of application and of course, I have, everyone has their biases and mine will come out here, but uh, beyond wealth and uh, resources, um, I think there's an inequality, uh, I guess you could classify it as resources, but in, in teaching and knowledge. Um, there is not a school that exists like this in the Philippines and a lot of Asia and the Arab countries around the world. And just driving from where I'm staying now to this school, I passed probably a dozen churches great bookstores, Christian bookstores, radio programs. There's a lot of places around the world that nothing like that exists. And so I, I'm just, as a challenge, and this is my bias, but I'd like to see more of you brothers get out. What are we, what are so many of us doing in this country with so much wealth of knowledge? When there's millions of people that have never heard the gospel or like the Philippines, 50,000 untrained pastors just winging it because no one else can do it. Uh, so do, do some of you know the name Robertson McQuilkin, who was president of Columbia Bible College for, for, for many years. Um, uh, he, he used to love to present a graphic uh, in which he, he graphed a world population of Christians and then superimposed on that percentage of Christian workers in each of those places. And it was a startling graphic, you know, making point of this, you know, in terms of you know, this many Christians in, in North America and this many workers, this many Christians in Asia, that many workers, you know, and just making that point. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure we can smuggle that into what James is saying here. Resources in a broader sense, if we're willing to put it in a broad comment. But I think all of us understand your heart in uh, reminding us of that, of that fact. Um, it's too easy for those in training for ministry just to assume, you know, and I think this is what Robertson McQuilkin used to say as well, um, and others I've heard say too, uh, that too many Christians are uh, preparing to stay and willing to go, whereas their attitude should be preparing to go, willing to stay. Um, there's something to that, isn't there? Yes? are kind of for the believer don't you know, it's, not, it's, it's not much fun to take us back to the passage again when we're just we're just kind of winging it here <laughs> if you insist I'm kind of slow so I need the repetition is the key to learning the principle here but uh, <laughs> if I got it right correct me if I'm wrong the, the point is as believers <coughs> don't adopt the mindset the attitude of the wealthy and also the encouragement is uh, in James' day for those that, uh, of you who are Poor, unrepresented, disenfranchised. Uh, there's this. There's there's hope for you. Um, you know, don't pursue riches because there's no future in it. And then, as we'll see in verse seven here, the admonition to be patient. Yeah, that's that's where that theme begins. We'll have to talk about that when we look at the next paragraph in terms of what kind of attitude people who might be poor should have toward all of this. I don't think that's in one to six, especially. Yeah, in one to six, again, uh, I think what James is doing to kind of summarize is to um, using a, a, a lot of biblical imagery and uh, biblical content to uh, uh, condemn rich people who are arrogant in their wealth uh, for these reasons, um, uh, for uh, selfishly, hoarding resources for themselves rather than sharing them, for um, uh, using the judicial processes to condemn and even murder people who get in their way, uh, to be unfair in paying their laborers. Uh, and then again, we've been talking about what the application of that might look like. 
some of which I think is clear enough. Um, you know, we, we need to be fair to people. We, 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 we should pay people what we owe them on time uh, to provide for their livelihood. Again, to me, the, the more controversial part of it and questionable part is this whole matter of hoarding and the condemnation of self-indulgence uh, with the implicit idea here perhaps that by hoarding we are depriving the poor of what they need. What does that look like? How do I flesh that out, live that out? That's, that's where I continue myself, uh, as my wife and I think and pray through a lot of this ourselves, uh, try to figure this out. I see my, my, my children struggling with this. Two of my sons uh, are making more money a year than I will ever make in a year already. And I see them struggling in terms of what should my lifestyle look like? Um, and I, I see for in, in both of their cases, again, that tug to um, uh, follow the easy, comfortable route uh, of as long as I give my 10% at church, uh, the rest of it's mine. Um, where I think the concept of tithe really plays against us sometimes uh, in terms of working against biblical principles, because it can give people what I think is a false refuge. <clears throat> uh, God has right to my 10%, but that's it. Rest is mine. 90% is for me to do with what I want. Um, and that, uh, again, that, that's not a New Testament principle at all, in my view.